Good morning and good evening, <clears throat> and also wherever you are. And uh, this is uh, uh, actually the sixth annual section of the China Globalization, China Global Think Tank, Innovation Think Tank. So, welcome to all of you. And I'm uh, Henry Huiyao Wang, founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization. Thank you for tuning in this uh, special opening dialogue of our sixth annual China Global Think Tank Innovation Forum 2021, live from uh, CCG head office here in Beijing. We're in our conference uh, uh, room. Uh, today, we are very honored, actually very pleased to have an, an old friend, also Dr. John Hammer. He's the president. Uh, of one of the most prominent think tanks in the US, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where short name the CSIS. So he's uh, uh, taking out his uh, time in the evening here with us. So we're going to explore the uh, topics that are centered about think tanks, about American foreign policy, about uh, pandemic changes, about uh, think tank innovation, which is uh, our conference today, but also about uh, uh, area we can collaborate. I would like to briefly uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. John Hammer. Um, he's the president and CEO and a Langong chair in American leadership at CSIS. Before joining CSI, he served as the 26th uh, US uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense and uh, held uh, senior positions in the US Senator Armed Service Committee and in the Congressional Budget Office. He has numerous uh, uh, involvement uh, in his uh, previous career. And he received his uh, PhD with distinction from SAS uh, of the John Hopkins University in 1978. So, so <laughs> welcome, uh, John, and uh, it's great to see you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang, and congratulations to you and the Center for China and Globalization. My goodness, what a wonderful job you've done in building this institution. It's very impressive. Thank you. Actually, we, we are today, you know, we are having uh, uh, this uh, sixth uh, annual Global Think Tank Innovation Summit. So we have very uh, privileged to invite you as the opening uh, speaker. And uh, we're going to have followed by a, a next panel. We're going to have uh, 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 five think tanks uh, from U.S. and China to talk about further. But to this, for this one, you know, we are, we are actually entering a very interesting time. And uh, as a uh, uh, during our pre uh, 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 this uh, start of the discussion, we know that the world has has changed uh, uh, fundamentally. We are we are facing pandemic, and we are we're having a lot of uh, challenges, and uh, and uh, the, the the world is really at a crossroad. And uh, so, uh, given your uh, your experience uh, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the leading the think tank of uh, uh, you know one of the leading think tank in the world. Uh, so, so we would like to open in uh, with you on the, on the think tank topic. Uh, as we know, you see, this is a, uh, is a think tank that was founded in 1962, which is uh, almost uh, 50, 60 years ago. And, uh, and you've been at home, you, you've been <laughs> running that think tank for 20 years. Uh, make that into, uh, you know, when, 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 you, when you come to that think tank, the think tank still have a deficit. Now you make that into one of the most influential think tanks uh, in, the, in the world. So. So what what what's your experience in in your share with us? How, your your how how you uh, have built up this think tank and what is your experience uh, uh, and uh, what is the uh, uh, your your uh, uh, recommendation? You know you know for our think tank community because we are having a think tank conference today. Yeah yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Wang, I um, boy, I I made so many mistakes uh, when I came to CSS, and you're right, we were. We were in very deep trouble when I first came to CSIS, uh, but we were able to get out of it. I think the our, in one sense, our poverty was helpful because we were so poor back then. We and we had to raise ninety-seven percent of our budget every year, so it made. I had to listen carefully to what the market wanted. I, I, I didn't have the luxury of just doing my own thing. We had to listen to what were the problems people were experiencing and how could we make a contribution. Uh, and then the 
key to success is the quality of your staff. Uh, it, it, I inherited a staff that wasn't very strong, to be honest. Uh, and th the entire journey of my 21 years has been to hire really good people. And so that's, uh, you know, hire good people, give them a lot of flexibility uh, and, and uh, establish the culture so that people feel that they have to do honest and objective work. That's really great. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> talent is always, almost, uh, always important. Uh, so, so I'd like to actually, uh, 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 you know, come to the recent uh, CSIS re released uh, a report. Uh, it's called "Advancing U.S.-China Healthy Security Cooperation in an Area of a Strategic uh, Competition," uh, which revolved around the area of U.S.-China can work together, uh, for example, on the health. Uh, including vaccine, travel, uh, public health infrastructure, uh, biosafety, supply chain, and the countering disinformation. And uh, so, as you know, that uh, think tank uh, these days, you know, can play a very active role in terms of making all those recommendations. So, what do you think now? Uh, with uh, we are facing this uh, uh, once in a century, probably, uh, catastrophe of this uh, pandemic. Uh, where did you see where we can get out of that and how we can really work together? I mean, internationally at, uh, uh, you know, multilateral level, and of course also China, U.S. as two largest uh, uh, leading country uh, in the economy, in the world. How we can work together and things like that. Yeah, these are, this is a very large and important question. Um, you know, there's a central paradox that we've experienced these last two years. Um, you know, it's very clear with something like a pandemic that no one country can act on its own and protect itself. I mean, there has to be international cooperation to deal with something like a global pandemic. But people that lead countries naturally respond to the pressure within their own country. And so there's a parochialism that gets that becomes very strong in a period like this. Every, every country in the world basically tried to find solutions for themselves uh, to deal with a pandemic. Uh, and it highlighted that international health organizations are not strong organizations. So I, I do think there is some very fundamental thinking that we need to do because we're not China isn't going to give up its capacity to, to decide its own path for health, public health. We're going to hold on to that ourselves. But we do have to find ways where we can cooperate. I think the bright spot over the last two years uh, was with the medical research community that where there were international networks that that. Uh, communicated with each other and, and joined together in, in a shared effort. In the private sector, international cooperation was very impressive. The, you know, in the public sector, governments, the cooperation wasn't so good, you know, but in the private sector, it was very good. And so I think it's a bit of a, an idea about what we could do in a broader sense, so we could work together. How do we help our respective civil societies to work more closely on medical preparedness? I think that's a real opportunity. Now, on specifically on China, look, we've got we, we you know, we're I, I'm unhappy about the direction we're in right now. There's a lot of tension between our two countries. The, we, you know, it's I, I don't. We have to find ways where we can work on shared problems. And certainly public health, global public health is a shared problem. So I think there's an opportunity here. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Actually, uh, uh, I, I know that uh, both U.S. and China are really favored that uh, patent wavering, uh, you know, for, for developing countries in terms of producing the vaccine. And, uh, you know, hopefully at the coming up at WTO ministerial meetings, you know, WTO, US and China can reach something on these uh, new efforts in terms of uh, supporting developing countries and getting vaccine. 
So uh, you know, un unless everyone is safe, we're finally safe. <laughs> we got to make a uh, make a make a, a lot of uh, lead on that. Uh, uh, you're right. You know, China and the U.S. can uh, work uh, many ways and uh, uh, on that. And and you you also mentioned about U.S. China uh, cooperation, and and also you're not satisfied with the with the with the current situation. Uh, 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 that uh, you think there's there's you know uh, ways to collaborate, and uh, so we're glad to see that. Uh, uh, you know, China and the U.S. has actually made a joint statement that uh, uh, COP26 on climate change. You know, so, so that is another big area. You know, we can collaborate, uh, uh, and uh, you know, pandemic could come again, or you know, even yeah. we are contained. You know, so what do you think about the you know climate change and the things that we can also work together in terms of the common the common background? Uh, well, I, I, I do think it is an area that we can work together. I'm, in, you know, I'm I'm impressed by a lot of the, the forward-looking policies that China has, for example, on electric vehicles. I mean, it's, it's impressive what China is proposing to do for itself. Um, you know, obviously, you are a country in transition, energy transition. We are too, but you're in a country with energy transition. And so I think there are opportunities that we could explore uh, where can we collaborate on mm. climate change? Um, you know, I mean, it, we do have to find a number of things where we can at least have conversations with each other, look at joint, potentially joint projects, just like in the healthcare area. I mean, there was actually a fairly robust collaboration between our medical scientists, you know, for many years, which was a good thing because it became the foundation point for the cooperation that did exist. For, for the pandemic. So we should look for these opportunities, Dr. Yeah, Wong. yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Dr. Uh, you know, John Hammer, uh, Henry. So, so what, what, uh, what uh, 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 I think that uh, really make the, uh, you know, the two countries uh, uh, interesting now is that the world has a lot of uh, uh, common demand, actually, you know, the, for example, the, the infrastructure, we, we see that uh, worldwide, there is a, there is a huge, uh, 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 demand for infrastructure, developing countries, but also developed countries. I noticed that uh, European uh, uh, leader just announced uh, last week they're going to uh, come up with 350 billion euro uh, on uh, uh, you know putting the your uh, your euro, euro, euro gateway, you know EU gateway uh, project for infrastructure. President uh, uh, Biden mentioned about uh, you know past. Uh, his 1.2 trillion uh, uh, infrastructure bill. And on the same day, he talked to President Xi uh, 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 well, after he signed that bill. And uh, of course, China has this uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which has been carrying on for the last eight years. So, so infrastructure-wise, I mean, we had the World Bank, we had the uh, uh, BRICS New Development Bank, uh, we had the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. You know, on this, uh, and also G7 proposed the Build back better, uh, D3W by President Biden. So, do you think that we can really, you know, work together on those uh, uh, infrastructure where I think we have the biggest de denominator, biggest uh, draw of uh, of the future benefits for everyone, and then that's where probably can sustain us for the next uh, half a century uh, of of uh, prosperity and success and and uh, and growth uh, potential. So, what do you think about that? You know, all those areas that we could uh, work on infrastructure. Yeah. You know, there's a there's an astounding demand around the world for infrastructure building. Uh, in some places, for brand new infrastructure. In some places, like in the United States, for modernizing our infrastructure. It's uh, you know, I will I'll be honest. It's rather embarrassing to look at the state of a lot of America's bridges and roads. Our airports are not they're they're d disappointing. So there's a lot that we should do. But globally, infrastructure is a major issue. And I think what we should probably do is, you know, start by looking at what are the areas where we know that there is a trend we're all going to want to deal with, such as uh, how, do, how do we build sustainable infrastructure, infrastructure that has a revenue base underneath it. So it doesn't become a white elephant, you know, it doesn't become a... Uh, you know, a very giant project that that can't support itself financially. So I think there's some financial things. I think we need to find ways to help uh, third, third world countries 
to do a better job of managing complex uh, tender offerings. Uh, this is a complicated thing. Infrastructure projects are big and elaborate and complex. Helping other countries do a better job of deciding what's in their interest, what is sustainable, those I think would be things we could work on together. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And uh, uh, so, John, I mean, uh, uh, you know, we're we also, the, uh, the theme of our topic today is also American uh, foreign policy. And mm. uh, uh, we, we know that, uh, I know it's very significant that, uh, uh, that uh, President Biden, actually, when he said uh, during the uh, Afghanistan withdrawal, uh, he, he said, uh, from now on, the U.S. will no, no longer seek nation building. And uh, which I think it's a, it's a very serious reflection of what has been happening in the last two decades in Afghanistan, maybe to that matter to other countries. So what do you think on, on that U.S. foreign policy front? Uh, there are some uh, you know, some deep thinking and uh, a reflection going on, and particularly President Biden saying that uh, uh, is, is, there, uh, is there a paradigm shift or something like that? Well, you know, it. I think President Biden was reflecting um, what the American public feels, which is we were in Afghanistan, we didn't have a strategy, we were not successful. And we shouldn't get involved in things where we don't know what we're doing. Uh, I think that's a basic, I think that was basically the commentary uh, of, that was behind that statement. Now, does it mean that America is going to pull back uh, from working with other countries in the world towards, you know, building stronger institutions, uh, et cetera? No, I don't think it means that we'll abandon that. But I do think it means that Americans uh, feel, uh, certainly the Biden administration feels this, but I think most Americans do, that uh, we used the military to excessively and we didn't really have a plan and we were not successful. And so it's, I think, a foreign policy that is more focused on uh, solid economics, on social development, and on traditional diplomacy is I think what he's talking about. The term nation building it took on a quality of an American, you know, kind of a, we were going to shape the world so it looked like us. And I think that is over. I don't think we're doing that any longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. And uh, I also noticed actually uh, uh, President Biden uh, said uh, during the President Xi and the President Biden virtual summit, uh, just uh, recently, he basically, President Biden said, uh, okay, the uh, U.S. Uh, does not seeking to change China and does not also want to have alliance against China. So uh, uh, he also uh, recognized one ch uh, China policy. So he showed some, uh, uh, you know, uh, positive yeah. uh, attitudes there. So, so but we are actually seeing, you know, probably U.S. is divided. You know, you have a very hawkish Congress, you have a uh, you know, other other uh, uh, stakeholders. So what do you think about, the, you know, can we really, you know, China-U.S. <laughs> relation? If if China, you know, uh, on its own, I mean, uh, can become the second largest economy, there must be something done right. And uh, so how can we really peacefully coexisting, as President Xi put it in, in the statement when he met uh, uh, virtually with President Biden? So what do you think about, uh, in general assessment, at that uh, what we can do about the sign of U.S. relations. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, the, the sentiments in Washington are very negative right now about China. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's, I think, very unfortunate because it makes us hard, it makes it hard for us to develop, you know, real ideas, real policies uh, in a constructive way. Um, Look, we're, we're two great countries. We're, we have global interests. We're going to have areas where we're going to disagree with each other. We're going to rub up against each other. You know, in ways. So we know because we've got these complex, multidimensional interests, and they're not always aligned. They're, not, they're sometimes their intention. Um, we have to find ways where we don't let the tension overwhelm us and prevent us from having the kind of constructive conversation to work through the problems. Now, 
in in the U.S., I think I, I think in Washington, I'll say in Washington, there are basically two camps, and one camp believes that China is racing ahead; it's going to be dangerous. We better stop them any way we can. That's one camp. The second camp, and I'm in the second camp. The second camp is this is a huge, unprecedented competition. We're out of shape. It's like a runner that hasn't been exercising. Well, we're out of shape. We're going to have to get in shape if we're going to stay up in this competition. Uh, so instead of trying to trip China because it's running ahead of us, we need to work harder to run faster. So I, I, I think I'm in the second camp. I believe that, um, that America's focus ought to be on improving ourselves fixing our own problems, overcoming the problems within our own society. This is where I think we should be focusing. Rather than, sh than having the conversation with China being about opposition to everything you say or do, you know, that's going to go nowhere in my view. So I'm in the camp that says if America is going to compete effectively, we've got to get stronger internally. Yeah, that's that's a, a great comment. I think that that is really more realistic and uh, a rational approach. Uh, so, so thank you for for your comment. And uh, uh, we know that uh, the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, is uh, uh, coming up with a <laughs> midterm election next year. And uh, 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 so, how do you how do you assess the the uh, the, the U.S. Uh, the political landscape? I mean, uh, we have uh, you know. Uh, Democrats barely have a majority at the, at the Senate House, and uh, and of course, uh, uh, you know the the we, we see the, the the gap, you know, the top elite and and then the massive population in the U.S. The gap is uh, is still still widening. I mean, uh, in terms of the middle class, haven't seen their real income uh, uh, gone up in the last mm -hmm. uh, you know 20, 30 years. And whereas uh, China now, I mean, they 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 preempting that, you know, they. They have been starting to, you know, common prosperity and lift 800 million people out of poverty, so prevent the populism, this kind of drive. So, uh, I, I think that uh, you know, uh, with uh, with Trump, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, even though he's not in office, but Trumpism is still very <laughs> thrive, uh, thriving. And uh, so, how do you assess the political, uh, 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 you know, future of of next two years? Where it's very important if. Uh, if uh, the U.S., uh, you know, direction the U.S. is taking, it's affecting the world. It's affecting U.S.-China relations. And you, you, you are the top expert on U.S. think tank. So probably this is your area. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's a bit, I, I'm hardly an expert, but I think about this uh, all the time. Um, you know, uh, America has had two periods in its history where there were profound changes in our political system. Uh, one was about 1842, basically, to 1860. Um, and, of course, that, that it, it ended in a civil war, which was a bad thing. Uh, the other big period of change, lots of tension, politics got turned upside down, was from about 1885 until 1915. Um, in both cases, it lasted over 20 years. And I'm, I'm afraid we're in the front end of a probably a 20-year period where our politics is going through profound restructuring. Um, and I, I, you know, I have my, my own personal views uh, about it. I don't think either party political party here is effectively focusing on the challenges we're going to face over the next 10 years or 15 years. I think both, both of the parties are battling over the, the you know, the, their policies of the past rather than looking forward to the future. So I think we're going to be internally divided. I think there will be, there's still going to be a lot of progressive work, but it's going to happen more at the state level. 
And I think the economic disparity that you mentioned is very real and is going to be the greatest thing we're going to have to work on. And I would say that's that's the big debate that we have right now uh, between the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, but I don't know that what's going to come out of it is going to be a, a breakthrough. Uh, I think we're going to have... I think we're going to have internal tension in the United States probably for the next 15 years.